Good afternoon, it's Joyful Hermit, and here I am again, but the weather shifted, and my pain in my hips and down my legs is so much that I am not up for doing anything else, really, and my thoughts are continue to be on just how awesome is it that my purpose and meaning of life is sort of... <laughs> coming to the fore here in uh, loving as God loves, learning this. Because really there's nothing more important in life than to love and to love well and to love as the one who is love, God, loves, perfect love. I was thinking back, I was going to do night, go through night prayer with you with the breviary, the divine office, but I think you can figure it out, and they do have instructions that come with it if you would happen to get this. But you can also just do your own through uh, choosing verses in the Bible and psalms, lots of psalms, and saying prayers, thoughts of your own of praying to God. But this is nice uh, because it's all organized for us for this over the centuries, and I like it being a hermit, because I am united with it. This is what I realize is so lovely for someone like me or anyone who's alone, um, is that it unites me in prayer with hundreds of thousands of people all over the world who are praying this at any one given time throughout the day and night with the time changes. So I like that aspect of being united in the power of the same prayers, going to God with those. But I, when my mother was ill, her final year in a nursing home, and I would go every day to be with her because she had pulmonary fibrosis, had never smoked. We never knew how she got that. Maybe exposed as a child or as an adult, we had an old house growing up and she did laundry down in the basement maybe there was asbestos or something but she must have been exposed to asbestos but her lungs basically she caught it I mean it, it became obvious at age 84 and she died at 86 and a half but her lungs gradually was as if they cemented over from the bottom up the tissues hardened and her breathing it was just a struggle to breathe she would cough and spit up sputum at this nice nursing home we had her in, uh, and she had insurance for it. Um, back in our hometown, she came back finally and uh, stayed with my dad's help from the other side. <laughs> Let me tell you about that another time, how, how God worked through my dad to help me to get her back and to help her to get back to where it would be more convenient and easier for her to be, and she had a sister still there, alive, who could visit her, and a couple of long-time very good friends who could be there with her. And I could not go out and stay where she was. I had a house that I couldn't just up and leave, and a son in college, but uh, some of the time he would be home, and I hated to have to admit it, but uh, he was a regular kid and teen and well young adult and his friends from high school and stuff and they had a wild party that even my nice neighbor woman complained to me about when I did get back when I had been out trying to help her so uh, she was in the nursing home I would go for the day I would take my bravery well she got to the point where the the uh, for care facility she could not eat in the dining room with the other people and my mom paid good money for this place but we have to understand her coughing and spitting up even though she'd use a tissue spit up sputum phlegm it was disgusting and a lot of these old people didn't understand there was nothing they could catch it was way before COVID it was back in 2004 and so she could no longer, was not allowed to eat in the dining room with them, which cut out social life for her. And she was a very social person. 
So I, uh, but I stayed with her. I was there every day except for when I would have pain sieges. And, um, and one time in the fall where she had gotten too testy with me, too rude, repeatedly and angry and took it out on me and I needed rest. So I took time off and told her why. And she did call me and apologize, not overtly apologize. My mom wasn't like that, but but said she really needed me, really missed me. And I would call every day, several times a day, inquiring, asking how she was doing. Because I felt bad, but I, I just could not allow any more of how she had become testy like that toward me uh, personally, personal little things she would say. So I immediately went back and spent the rest of the time until she passed with her. But, um, and she did turn the corner too. She knew she had crossed the line in not being kind to me. So, but she loved me very much. Uh, our human love is imperfect. And that's why if we can learn to love as God loves, even in partly more spiritual love. And through that time period apart, my mother did grow. And she, when I went back, loved me with a respect that hadn't been quite there before. So it was good. Anyway, I would take my bravery and would be reading it. And her eyes had started to fail terribly. And, and, uh, in the past, though, she she was very skeptical of a bravery of this little book because to her it was Catholic, meant Catholic. And my sister also, one of my sisters, um, when my dad had died, there was something in the night office, office of readings at night, that, um, I, the, that was so beautiful, and it was from the Bible, but it happened to be in my bravery. And my mother loved it, and she wanted it to be read at my dad's memorial service because she loved it. It it had consoled her when my dad was dying. And it's this. It's what um, Simeon had said. It's from Luke 2. Lord, now let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. My mother had had a hard time letting go of my dad. And I read this to her one night, long distance before we went, I went out, my sister went out, um, one of my sisters also, for when he passed. And um, I was trying to explain to my mom, let him go. He has done his work on earth. Let your servant go in peace. Let God's servant go in peace. Um, his word has been fulfilled and all that. And she loved it. And it, it was the turning point for her to be able to emotionally let go and be at peace with letting dad die. So um, anyway, and when I had, uh, in her apartment out there, it was in Arizona, and she says, now, where was that? What was that? You know, she wanted to know. And I reached for my bereavery and opened it up. And my sister, that's Catholic. That's Catholic. And my mother, oh, oh, is that Catholic? I said, no. I said, it's from the Bible. It's just in this book that has devotions and scriptures and prayers and hymns. And that scripture happens to be in here. And I happened to bring it with me. <laughs> so anyway, I, I said, get a Bible out. My sister gets a Bible because she did no one was going to believe me because I was Catholic. And I said, look up Luke 2, 29, 32. And there it was. So, you know, they were relieved. But then, you know, three years later, when my mom was in her uh, dying process, back in, in my in the Midwest state, um, I would take my bravery to read my the hours, the prayers, and I read silently. So she says, well, what, what are you reading over there? What are you reading? And I said, well, I'm just reading in my bravery and, you know, different psalms and different scriptures. Well, 
would you mind reading it aloud? I, I wouldn't mind hearing if that's what it is. And I said, yes. And every now and then they have prayers and things added to, added to and different refrains called antiphons that are like, like little short hymn, hymn phrases. So I started reading, and, and she says, well, now, don't read that other. Just, just read the Psalms, and just read the Psalms, because the prayers, I don't know. Here's a prayer here. Lord, give our bodies restful sleep, and let the work we have done today bear fruit in eternal life. We ask this through Christ our Lord. But my mother had been reared. This is generational anti-Catholic misunderstanding and ignorance so that you know she was worried about anything that wasn't just from the bible that was in this catholic bravery so i didn't read it so i would just stop and then read that silently but i would read all the psalms to her and she came to like the psalms so one day she said well go ahead and read the other stuff too <laughs> So, you know, I would read the prayers, and then there would be bits of scripture, like that canticle, like like from Luke and others. And then she even came to wanting to, you know, I would read hymns, and she didn't realize that hymns that she had grown up with and through adulthood in our Methodist church were hymns that were written by Catholic hymnists back then. And I said, Mom, before 1526, we were all Catholic. And she admitted and she showed me a photo of some relatives in Germany. She was mostly German, half German, that um, uh, were Catholic. And some other relatives had met them back in the 1960s. And they were still in this village outside of Stuttgart. And there was a statue of Count Everhart our ancestor, and he was Catholic, so she was mellowing, and I don't ever expect anyone to become this or that. I believe God brings us to what he needs us to be and knows we can accept and will learn from and, and what we need, and God knew I needed Catholicism. And I, like I said before, I fought it for 10 years. But anyway, that's a little more of the bravery and how my mother then got my aunt reading the Psalms to her when she, my aunt would come and visit her. And my aunt got into the Psalms and at uh, the graveside service that we had privately for my mother, uh, my aunt chose to read Psalms and talked about how her sister had told her, my mother had told her, how she loves the Psalms. Now, she didn't say why or how she got involved with the Psalms and how peaceful and how helpful they were to her. But she loved them. And my aunt, in turn, then became to, came to love the Psalms. So, um, and my mother read the Bible but not as much. I was surprised when I became Catholic how much Bible. Because, <laughs> you know, we Protestants think, you know, well, we, we're the Bible people. And um, then when I realized that every single Mass, daily Masses I would go to, and when I was in a larger city, I could go morning and noon to Mass. I liked hearing the different sermons. And I liked hearing the, the scriptures read over again. I loved Mass. I just fell in love with Mass. It's the most worshipful experience that I've had. And um, so the scriptures are read at every Mass. An Old Testament reading or an epistle reading, one of the letters from the New Testament, uh, the Psalms, and a Gospel. And then the hymns and all are... So um, if you listen, and, and they every three years, if you go to daily ma or go to mass, even weekly ma week uh, Sunday masses, you get the whole Bible in th every three year cycles, over and over and over. So, and then of course, 
encouraged to read on your own at home, too. So, and then if you read the Divine Office, you're going to get a lot more as well. But um, I was thinking of that and how not to be afraid of something. And um, Catholics aren't either. You know, like if a Protestant writes a wonderful uh, Christian book or Billy Graham speaking and they have videos of him, um, my spiritual father got his autobiography, Billy Graham's autobiography, to read because he admired him. He was in awe of how he preached and filled stadiums with his preaching. So um, we should not fear other faiths, especially Christians, you know. But so many people think Catholics are not Christian. So um, don't be afraid of the contributions of Protestants and Catholics to Christianity. It, um, why cut ourselves off from good? That's how I look at it anyway. So I was reading today the mass, the, the readings for mass. I get them on, online. And the first reading was from Romans. It's been going through the book of Romans every day. So um, just reading in that, Romans 12, 5 through 16, and maybe down about starting at verse 8, I thought, wow, this relates with loving as God loves. Let love be sincere. Hate what is evil. God doesn't love hate. He, hate. he hates, I mean, God, yeah, he doesn't love evil. He hates evil. Let love be sincere. Hate what is evil. Hold on to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. That's what viewer Noah had um, put in his, in his comment yesterday regarding equality, to love with equality, mutual affection. It had come from a scripture of Jeremiah that Noah shared with us. Um, love, uh, anticipate one another with showing honor. It's another way to love. Bless those who persecute you. We're getting into forgiveness. God is lo God loves with forgiveness. God forgives us. All we have to say is, God, forgive me for this or that. Instantaneously forgiveness. The psalmist says, you know, your sins will be washed as white as snow. Repent, though. Repent. Say you're sorry. Tell God you're sorry and your sins, your, your sins will become white as snow. Um, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. That's having compassion. Love with compassion. Have the same regard for another, one another. That's loving equally. Uh, do not be haughty, but as associate with the lowly. Love with, have humility. We love with humility. That's how God loves. God, God is very humble. So, um, then there was a, um, uh, another line um, in a psalm that I just picked up on in the readings for today's Mass. Hope in the Lord both now and forever. Hope in the Lord, Lord both now and forever. We haven't talked about it yet, but I have thought about it. The th and I've mentioned it, the three theological virtues, hope, faith and charity these are attributes of how god loves also hope is part of love if we don't have hope we can't love if we don't have hope that we can learn to love as god loves then it's over but god gives us hope that's one of the virtues the 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 godly virtues, theological, the God, the God virtues that God gives us, gives to us, that allows us to love as God loves, having hope. Um, 
So I liked that very much. And I also thought there's a, a couple of other, maybe three or four now, who have um, viewed my videos, I think from some of the videos in which I spoke of my narcissistic sociopathic ex-husband and the years of marriage that we had. And, and these people were even longer in their relationships. And one is has PTSD, a severe form of PTSD that's requiring a specialized therapy to try to heal from the PTSD caused by living with a narcissist. Um, so an, narcissism is another, and it's, a, it's a, also a very bad and terrible personality disorder. And the uh, marriage or, and, and parent-child parent relationships can be damaged, seriously damaged. People can be damaged by living with people who have these terrible personality disorders and that they don't get help for. And some of them require lifelong therapy and work. It's like if they would recognize, but some have their personality disorder is such that they cannot see or accept that they aren't perfect, that they aren't great, number one. A narcissist um, would have a hard time going to therapy because they're the ones that know. They're the great ones. They're the center of attention. They're the ones that are better than anyone else. So to even get them to grasp that they have this disorder is difficult, let alone to get them to go ongoing. It's the kind of thing that it isn't, there are some disorders that can be healed and you're finished with therapy and you're going to be okay and others that require it for as long as you're alive. So a sociopath are usually ones that need to have ongoing if they go, and they tend not to go. And same with narcissists. So, um, but I've got, I started thinking when I have been, I haven't had as many flashbacks myself since I've gotten onto a pondering uh, loving like God loves or how God loves. And um, because the Bible's, you know, sparking again with me, um, just like, with these readings, it's like I'm picking, it's like God is saying, here, look at this, look at this, look at this. This is how I love. You can do this. You can learn this. So when I think back now with uh, the thing I might do in discussing, because people have said, please keep talking about your relationship with the, with the husband, with the narcissistic sociopath, so other people can be warned and learn about it and learn how they act so that they can be aware and and maybe be protected and saved from being duped and deceived into a relationship with them because they're very tricky. And narcissists are tricky because they come off as so great and wonderful that, you know, you don't see the bad. It's, it's deceptive because they are deceived with how wonderful they think they are. They are like God themselves. And when I'm saying that we're learning to love like God, I'm not saying that we are God. <laughs> so um, we're just learning to love like God. Big difference. So um, I started thinking of uh, other situations with my ex-husband, and I think I will share. And I think when I do share, it's not going to upset me like it has before because I'm seeing, and I wrote to Dr. H about this, I'm seeing through analyzing um, how my husband loved temporally and carnally compared to how I loved 
which was more spiritual, but nothing like I have learned over the years and how I am so fallen short of where I want to learn how to love. Because I see my imperfections with love. And I, I saw my impatience yesterday and what a handicap that was. And I saw the day before that I had a kind of trickery in a way. I was upset that I was being sort of toyed with by someone, um, not being open or, or upfront with me. And so I, I put out a little worm or a, a worm on a line for the person. And um, I guess I thought, well, if they would snag hold of it, then we would talk. And then I told myself, how, how low are you going to sink? You know, how immature am I going to be, you 72-and-a-half-year-old lady, to do a ploy like that, to dangle this little tidbit of info or something <laughs> in order to get some conversation. Oh, how pathetic. So that's not, I mean, I loved the person and I loved, I wanted to talk with a person or, or to text or something. But that's not, that's not the way God does it. God does not impose himself upon us when we don't want. And especially if we're playing games with God or doing ploys or or you know or or with anyone that that's not God doesn't want us to be um loving uh, he wants us to be like him he created us in his image so um that's how important this is i'm realizing it's probably the most important thing it probably is my mission in life, why God sent me back to help work through this and share with others and go through a process of learning to love as God loves. And I'm about maybe 30, 32 years after my son came up with this question of why are we here? What's life all about? Well, it's to love, to learn to love. To love as God loves. To learn to really love. Spiritual love. Holy love. So, um, I think I will talk about some things with the ex-husband that those of you who want to um, learn more about how a narcissist and a narcissistic sociopath functions, um, you will from that. But I think you'll also learn that your healing and my healing are healing from damaged emotions and uh, PTSD trauma from being with a person and being in love with a person who abused, abused us horribly. That um, our healing is going to come in learning to love as God loves. And that's the way anyone will know if we come to a spiritual love, an ability to love spiritually, we will know and connect with others who also are on a path of more spiritual love or who are willing to learn it. Learn how to love as God loves or love spiritually. And um, that's, that is healing and it takes us to the next level. And it also will develop our souls to a, a spiritual level that will preclude a lot of disappointments in life. We will still have them, but we'll know how to bless those who persecute us sincerely, actually, with actuality and reality. 
um, we will have hope, true hope. Um, we will automatically hate what is evil. We will love sincerely. We will love with equality and justice, etc., etc., etc. We will automatically desire doing sincere and compassionate acts of kindness for one another. That's the point. So just, I gave some examples before of my husband that he was not a gift giver. And he didn't really want children, but I, I couldn't believe that. And I thought, well, probably every, and I think I probably talked to a couple of girlfriends or women, oh, well, you know, men, they sometimes need to be talked into it. It's a big step for a man, the responsibility or whatever. And I didn't realize with mine, who was a womanizer even back then, even while we were engaged, I found out at later, um, but he, uh, that having a baby, being a father was going to, uh, he felt, cause a problem with being um, available to women, anyone he wanted, because he preyed upon women, as school teachers, usually ones that either weren't married or ones with weaker marriages, or ones that would be a real get, even if they were married. Wow, you know. What an intriguing game, because narc sociopaths like to play this game of um, and how great they are, the narcissists in them, that they can get someone who is really solid and pull them away from their husband. That, that's a huge ego boost for them and quite an intrigue if they can pull it off without being caught. That they like that, that intrigue. It's a real game. It's a sport. So um, I had uh, talked him into negotiated sort of, you know, yes, yes, I'll go back to work, you know. He wanted that for financial security or whatever. Control over me was the bottom line. They do want control over their, their prey. Um, and they taunt with the prey. But so... Uh, we had a baby, as I mentioned in another video. He didn't tell anyone in his school that I was pregnant all through the pregnancy. And it was a teacher at my school, my high school, who, um, where I taught, whose wife was a teacher with him as a teacher at his elementary school, who mentioned about maybe it was a week or two weeks before due date that that um, the the husband mentioned to the wife that I was pregnant. He had, I think we had a conference period at the same time and maybe talked or something. He saw me and we talked a little bit. And he mentioned it to his wife, something I must have said. And that I was pregnant. No one at his school knew. So she went to the school and said, well, the, hus the, the man at my school told me that no one at, at, do you realize no one at your husband's school knows that you two are having a baby? And I don't know why he told me. I later figured he probably knew, and she probably knew, he was probably having an affair with one of the teachers at his school. Or they knew he had affairs with teachers in the teachers' union. I'm pretty sure that God gave me some hints that I buried down when he got involved with the teachers' union and would be gone late at night and go off on these weekend uh, conferences and whatever. And he went on one. He didn't want me to come, and I insisted. But then he said, well, you stay stay in the motel room. You know, you can't come to the meetings. Well, later, t other teachers says, oh, you could come. You're a teacher, for pity's sakes. But anyway, no, he, um, and, and I, I did. We had our children with us. We could have taken a sitter, but um, with us, we did another time when with marriage work we were doing from a therapist, but 
Anyway, I was deeply crushed. But I, I think it works also with, with certain people. I was ripe. I was a codependent type person. I grew up in a family where my dad was an alcoholic and, and quit drinking when I was 11. And then my mother had this temper, and I think partly due to the situation with her own marriage and her husband and his drinking, which was upsetting. And he also had a job that was traveled a lot. So she had the family during the week, and then he played golf on the weekends in the summer, spring, summer, and fall. Yeah, but not on Sundays. She did say you must be home on Sundays, and I'm glad she did. We needed to be around our dad more. So, And he was a wonderful, wonderful father. But he um, maybe issues with his mother who died suddenly and not at an old age. Um, or that he didn't have a son. I, who knows what. It also ran in his family. Alcoholism did. But I was a pleaser person. And that's how I grew up. And also tr a peacekeeper type. Tried to keep peace um, in my own family. I did what I was told. I didn't want my mother to be upset or have a temper. Get upset with me. And I also always wanted to please my dad because he, I didn't see him that often. so And he was the male figure for me. So um, I think all of that fit in with why I, I didn't have a lot of experience with men either. <laughs> I had dated, but uh, not anything long-term or as serious, obviously. I had one boyfriend in college who was serious that bro broke up, and he was not a good type either. I think I attracted my weakness, my, my naivete, and the ability to be controlled um, and to hold things in was um, part of my contribution to the unhealth. So um, I held that in. I never said. And then after the baby was born, and my mother had come out to be with us, and um, my husband did, would change diapers, and he was very proud of this baby, very proud, and once the baby was born. and um, But I watched a movie that um, would have been maybe five days after the baby was born. I was back home, and it was Parent Trap. And I had this ominous feeling of divorce. I really did. But there had already been signs. And an uh, earlier time that I caught him, uh, we were, it was before we had children, and uh, we were with some people who had uh, taken a class with him. The husband had taken a class with my husband and had invited us up with his wife, who was also a teacher and I was teaching, to their uh, con vacation condo up near the mountains or something or high desert. So we went over Memorial Weekend. Um, and the husband started talking and laughing at dinner, mentioning some woman and how, and said, oh, yeah, and, um, is that still, something about, is that still going on? And um, you you really uh, liked eating out together, something like that in front of me. And I picked up on it, of course. And I knew he had come home late from classes and wasn't hungry, unusually late, um, from when he should have been. But he would always tell me, well, you know, the class lasted longer, or I had to discuss with the professor this or that, or um, things like that. And uh, no, he had been going out to dinner with some woman. And, who, and obviously, 
I mean, after I knew what all he had been doing, probably had sex in his car, or well, her car, probably. The car he used was, except sometimes he would bought, borrow my car. The car that I'd had that my parents let us buy from them was a nice car. <laughs> but his car uh, that he had had was a little tiny old VW Bug, so doubt he did that. But sometimes he would take the car, I, I my car, <laughs> to go to class, no doubt, uh, you know, that's just, that's reality. He probably had sex in the nicer car, or if she had a nicer car. But um, uh, back then, I just, I, I got upset at the table, started to cry, went up to the room that we were in, in their condo. Well, he came up, and the, the man apologized. He, he somehow, I guess, thought I knew. that I don't know. Maybe this couple was an open marriage couple and inviting us up. Maybe they thought it was going to be a four-summer or something. Who knows? It was Southern California, not my type of place, as it turned out. I was so naive, nice girl from the Midwest. So, um, <laughs> anyway, uh, and so many people there you could never find people who would really, I wouldn't have found out ahead of time about him anyway, because um, there is just such a vast area of high population. I did run into one man in when I was substituting the first year that, that we were married. I, we got married in November, and um, I subbed because it was too late for me to get a full-time job. So I subbed that year, and one of the schools I subbed in, I had, we weren't married, they had my engagement ring on, but this teacher in the school said, um, asked who I was, and I said, and, and I said, well, some, he asked something about my ring. I said, well, I'm engaged, and said to whom? And he goes, oh, he said he was engaged to Karen. Karen, forget her last name, German woman. Well, the ex had, at the time, my fiancé had told me about how he had dated her. His mother had mentioned that he had just been, you know, just been with, had a girlfriend, didn't say fiancé. This was the first I heard that she was a fiancé and that they were planning to get married. He had told me a big, long story, all her fault, and that um, she had gone back to Germany, and um, her visa had run out, he said, and he went over at Christmas to see her, but she was in Sweden and got an abortion. She, He said she'd gotten pregnant by a boyfriend over there, and that's why he broke up with her, because he cheated on her, on him, when he went, when she went back to, uh, had to stay a certain length of time before she was going to come back. She had to get a new visa. She'd gotten pregnant and had an abortion. And he went over, though, and to meet her, but she'd already left for Sweden. So he found her in Sweden after she'd had the abortion of supposedly this old boyfriend's baby. Well, um, later on, after we were married, and... and and he said how she would call and long distance and it would ring up his phone bill. I said, well, change your phone number. Oh, so he changed the phone number. Had I not said that, he would have carried on. No, he was continuing while he was engaged to me, friendship with her. She hadn't remarried and she hadn't gotten pregnant by a boyfriend. It would, ended up, it was his baby. And that's why he went over at Christmas. But he didn't want to marry her. And he wanted her to have an abortion. But she went ahead and had it before he got there. That was the truth of the situation. She sent a letter later on, like three years later. She had wanted him to ship back items of her, hers previously that he said were in some storage. He refused to ship them. He said they were going to cost X amount of money 
and thought she should send the money to pay. Well, I guess she was undoubtedly crushed and broken that, you know, he didn't want their baby, he didn't want to marry her, and then on top of it, he wouldn't send back her belongings, so she just forgot it, I guess. Unless he shipped them and didn't tell me and used our money, I don't know, but I was fine with him shipping them back. I felt he should. But I, at that time, didn't know, and he had turned me against her in my mind as that she was the one at fault. But I felt for her. I always had compassion, and there was always this little thing in me, especially after we got a letter from her, saying that she had found someone that she was marrying and wanted him to know that she was getting married. And I realized a woman wouldn't write a nice letter like that back. Uh, sincere and um, intimate, even, of her life. And uh, letting him know that she had moved on in her life. I recognize we had just had our baby girl, our first baby, when that letter came. And I thought about confronting, but I thought, we've got this baby already back uh, two years prior when I was up in that, um, in that condo with that couple and had that shock that he had been dining out with this woman in the night and coming home late for being with this woman in from his class. And the way the man laughed sunk in me that something wasn't right. When we he came up to the bedroom and I was crying, no compassion, no I'm sorry. It was if you're going to act like this and embarrass me in front of our, my friends, we can just get a divorce now. That boom, right out. And I was like, what? I said, no, we're, we're married. We work through things. When you're married, you work through things. You just don't. But looking back, you know, we can look back and see all these times. I thought of the beautiful wedding my parents had for me in my church of my childhood and growing up years the altar, the vows, um, all our hopes and dreams that we would talk over. He was a great talker, and he was very sincere acting when he would talk and do all this. Very, they are, they live a double life, a triple life, a multitudinous life. And I think in their own heads in the moment, they even believe what they say. They really do. But they are sick. And they have accepted evil. At some point in their lives, when they started lying as little children and started making up stories and getting away with it, and their deep down insecurity inside needed to be built up for whatever reasons they felt, it became a game and a sickness, and the devil enters in and takes over. It's sheer evil as they turn out. They lack compassion. They lack the opposite of how God loves. And that's why another reason why I think God has brought me to this at this point in my life, because I wasn't able to stop the flashbacks, no matter the years of therapy, off and on, not continuous. But um, this is going to heal me, because I will be able to see how this other person didn't know how to love as God loves. No empathy. And no real concern, did not love equally or justly or fairly. 
um, anyway, on and on we could go with it. But no, I said, no, we've got to work on this. We've got to, we have vows we made and on and on. And I think that's what he wanted because um, I was very attractive then. I was young, intelligent. I was a hard worker. We had, we already had purchased a home through my finding one and showing him how we could do it. He wanted to get a boat. And I explained to him real estate and loans. And my parents lent us the down payment, which we paid back in two years' time. And the house uh, nearly doubled in value in two and a half years. When I found another house that would be a good, I kept getting us moved so that we would make, build up money because teachers don't build up a money base. And it was going to be a while before he would get into administration, if ever, I didn't know. But that incident had happened. And I shoved it down deep then. And I told myself, well, probably he didn't do anything. He, he's friendly. Uh, he uh, was working on a project with her, he said. They had to talk over that. Uh, forgive him. You know, it's just one of those things that he was thoughtless. And, um, and of course, he had all kinds of stories about how it was nothing and that they had to work on this project together and that just gave them extra time and he was hungry so they just ate and blah 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 so uh, but no no <laughs> the man's little laugh and how he brought it up and sort of sniggered a little bit and his wife looked at him like keep your mouth shut and you know i picked up all these things that's why i left and went up to the room and was sobbing but um, fool that I was, and we have to forgive ourselves. I'm saying this for these women, who, especially the one that is very traumatized from all she went through. So um, um, we'll get there. Anyone who goes through anything like that or other personality disorders uh, can be someone who's married to someone with OCPD, not the same as OCD. OCPD is obsessive compulsive personality disorder. It's worse in many ways than obsessive compulsive disorder. Read up on it. That's a good thing we can all do for ourselves because our society is booming with more and more people, men and women. Women typically get OCPD, and it, it becomes such a controlling factor, it can destroy the husband. Few men can stay married to someone who has OCPD, but if they do, if they don't get therapy themselves, they can end up being really emotionally and psychologically destroyed, break down, depressed, and especially if they feel they cannot get out of the marriage or should not for religious reasons or for their vows or for um, not wanting to lose something that, that they built or something like that. The temporal can get a real hold over us. That was part of my situation with here was this newborn baby girl that we had in our house that um, I thought we'll just move through that uh, in my gut. I knew that he was the father of the aborted baby. And later on, I had affirmation that he would have wanted the abortion because he did it to me. He wanted that of me. Um, of course, I did not. But um, and that's another story of how I worked it out to jolly him out of that and tried to tell myself that he was just joking. 
when I knew he was not. So in these relationships, there's two people. And I'm very aware that I was one of them and very aware of why and what I did that um, because I didn't want, I loved the person. I could, uh, I could, I had aspects of spiritual love. I did. And, but the other person didn't. And that's why I also think this is an important um, understanding or learning experience to learn to love how God loves uh, because uh, it can help other people with their relationships and it can help with adult child relationships adult adult child and adult with adult children and it can help it with friendships any kind of relationship and also it can help us to discern that if we are relating with someone who does not want to even strive to love spiritually that that person is not really going to be for us. What does it say here? Hate what is evil. Hold on to what is good. Um, someone who does not is not interested in a holy love, learning to love in a holy way, that's not good for us, especially if that's what we want. And consider two people who just want to remain in temporal love. What's that going to do for society, for the world, for each other? Not much. The temporal is passing away. I'll stop. This is an extra long one. Anyway, I just hope and pray that there's something of worth that I share to help people. That's... That's what I hope. And in the meantime, it will help me too, though. I admit that. God bless his real presence in you and in me and all of us. And let us continue to learn to love as God loves.